Rafael Hill. I'm a rising junior at Carson High School. My name is Rafael Martinez. I'm a rising senior at Carson High School. My name is Nabaya Bird, and I'm a rising senior at Ulysses Grant. So the universe was formed with a big bang, but what happened right after? So there was a period of dark ages, and during this period, the bulk of the cosmos was made up of neutral hydrogen, neutral hydrogen floating in a sea of background radiation from the big bang. And there was nothing like stars that was able to emit light. After the dark ages is when the first stars were formed. This time period is called the cosmic dawn. It is estimated to have been from 100 million to 500 million years after the big bang. As Alan stated in the previous slides, the white light at the beginning is the Big Bang, the blue is the Dark Ages, and then the light. Oh, sorry. And then the spot that's like circled or squared or whatever is when the first stars were forming. And if you look at the very far end, that's where we are now. This one? Oh, yeah. The big question. By studying stars like our sun, we know that stars need heavier elements other than hydrogen to form. But in the dark ages and cosmic dawn, there was only hydrogen. And then how did the first stars form? Now we know that in the dark ages there was mostly hydrogen. Now we use that hydrogen to be able to study what was going on around that time. Um, you use the greater weight of that hydrogen um, that is sent out at 21 centimeters in wavelength or in 1420 megahertz. And as you can see in the GIF, wavelengths travel in different lengths. The larger the wavelength, the less the frequency that they have, and the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency they have. Now, the way that we receive the um, radio waves from the hydrogen is that the, the electron is going around the nucleus of the um, hydrogen atom, and then it suddenly flips. When it flips, it releases radiation, which is then transmits it to the radio width which we receive or the information. Now, and you can see in the middle where there is a rainbow, that is what we're able to see with a telescope, an optical telescope. And the 21 centimeter wavelength from the hydrogen is right up where the arrow is pointed at FM. Now, as you can see, that isn't what we can see optically, so therefore we can use an optical telescope then we have to rely on the wavelengths in order to be able to receive and know the information that, of that time. Um, the picture that you see on the left, which is like, what does radio telescope look like? The one on the left is located in Australia and it's a compact array, which is like shaped like a dish or whatever. And then <laughs> while it's the one on the right is located in Bishop, California, and it is only used for our project and it's shaped like angel wings. <laughs> These are some things around us that emit radio waves, such as cell phones, flat screen TVs, radios, and even those like old broken televisions that none of us use anymore. <laughs> now, there are a lot of things that come around with the hydrogen frequency. So this is like free explain. So we would like to do an experiment with you guys. So if we could have two volunteers.
No? no. You weren't able to? No. 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 We would need everybody to clap all at the same time. Don't try to overdo it. It'd be like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then just like. Yeah. And then everyone else claps like super loud. So we also let you hear her. So um, just like we were kind of barely able to hear her. <laughs> that is what we struggle with when we are trying to receive the frequencies from the hydrogen atom. There are a lot of things that are blocking that um, frequency that we want to hear. So we have to then um, clear it out and only receive the one that we want. You can take a moment to look at the comic that we have up there. The image on the left are the radio antennas that we are modeling. They are up in Owens Valley, and they are called the Long Wavelength Array. And on the right is the model that we were playing around with. We were changing the purple part, which is the soil. So it's a lot of distractions that can get in the way of us receiving the desired signal that we wanted from the first stars. So for our project, we decided to focus on soil specifically. And the question that we had was, how do different types of soil impact the detection of the signal from the first stars? So, what are the different soil types? We used sand, silk, clay, and saline. <laughs> Their conductivity is what differentiates them, and we all decided to choose different soil types. Hypothesis, um, AC and I hypothesized that the soil type with higher conductivity would provide better data, whereas rock up hypothesized that soil with lower conductivity would provide the better data. So um, to test our hypothesis, every day we drove all the way to Bishop, California. <laughs> the first week I hauled sand under a radio telescope and took readings and analyzed it. Week two was Alan's turn, working with the soil type silk, and week three was rock was clay. Like you get the point. Um, but no, we uh, used a CAD simulation software called FICO, and here are the few parts of our experiment. One, choose the soil type. Two, include soil in the antenna model, and then three, run the CAD FICO program, and then four, plot the graphs. Now here is the program that we were using. On the right, you are able to see the model of the antenna. And on the left part are all the parts of the antenna. The part that is circled in red is the soil. And when we clicked it, we were able to change the conductivity of the soil to the one that we saw. Now, um, this is another program we were using, Post Fico. This one we used when we were plotting our graph. The colorful sphere around the antenna is the frequency and the um, responses that we received from the antenna. And we noticed well, what we want more red. The more red, the better, because that is, means that we are receiving more information. This graph compares the response of the antenna at the tippy top, like X of the antenna. Rafa's graph is the pink dotted line. It starts increasing, but slowly starts to decrease. Um, my graph is the green solid line. It has a lot of ripples, but has a moment of consistency. And Alan's graph is the purple dotted line. It has a steady increase then drops and lower and then increases again. It is the one that has the most ripples. But the graph that has the highest gain and least ripples is pink. So the graph that Bridges described was the data over at the top. And the data right here is in relation to this X right here. And towards the middle yellow region. So Rafa's graph was the pink dotted line with the largest gain, but it dropped with frequency. Bree's graph is a green solid line, and it has the most ripples. My line is the purple dotted line. It doesn't have many ripples, but it also has less gain than Rafa's. So the pink graph ended up being having the highest gain with the least ripples. Now for the third graph, we are looking at the left part of the yellow region. Um, we noticed that my graph is the uh, smoothest and it has the um, highest gain. Bree's graph has a lot of ripples and Alan drops all the way at the end and has a few ripples throughout. 
So once again, my graph, pink one, would be the preferred one. Now, with all of the graphs in mind, we notice that the higher the conductivity, the better the result that we get. So with that, we could go up to um, the radio antennas and change all of the soil that is under the antenna. But unfortunately, we don't have the funds for that. And even <laughs> if we did, we wouldn't know how deep we would have to go into the soil and change everything. So in the future, we recommend that um, the astronomers continue to find the actual properties of the soil so that we can do the exact values in the simulation so that we able, are able to get an exact response of the antenna. And that response will be used to receive the radio waves without any confusion from the first start. <laughs> and Navita for their help in guiding us throughout this whole process. And we want to thank you for listening to your favorite Cosmos Explorers. <laughs>